blessings to you on another day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We thank God for all of the blessings that he bestow upon us each and every day. And we give him the glory for his goodness. We give him the glory for his grace. We give God the glory for his wondrous works that he has done and continues to do in our lives. We're continuing our study on the gospel of Mark, and we're thankful for the way that we have been ushered into this gospel uh, by uh, looking from a historical perspective of who uh, wrote this gospel uh, from looking at a context out of which uh, those times were the backdrop by which uh, the early Christian writers and the early Christian church uh, began uh, their journey uh, into human history, bringing forth the gospel, the good news of God's grace, God's love, God's mercy, and how that was expressed in Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of God. And so we're looking at this gospel, gospel of Mark from the perspective of understanding Jesus Christ uh, exploring and investigating his ministry and uh, going deeper and deeper into who he was and what he has meant to the church. So that is our context. And I will begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, we're thankful for another day and another opportunity to study your word, to learn and to grow in our faith and to become better in our work, in our witness, in our worship. We pray, oh God, that you would have your way with us individually and collectively, that we may become the best servants that you have called for such a time as this. And now as we study the scriptures today, as we reflect upon the scriptures, may your Holy Spirit guide, reside, and preside over all that is said and done, that it may give honor and glory to your name, in Christ we pray, amen. The most significant step that brings to bear our relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ is baptism. 
we in the United Methodist Church have a unique understanding of baptism that differs in many ways from other faith traditions. When the elder baptizes a person, whether it's a baby, whether it's a child, or whether it's an adult, it is a symbolic spiritual act or what we call sacrament whereby the person is initiated into the body of Christ, into Christ's holy church. And it is the means of grace by which we are incorporated into the grace of God. So through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's Holy Church. We are incorporated into God's mighty act of salvation. We are given new birth through the water and the spirit. All this is a gift from God. That is what I or an elder says as the introductory remarks. Baptism was so significant that John the baptizer or John the Baptist uh, in the first scriptures that we read in the gospel of Mark baptized Jesus. And this became the means in which God symbolically demonstrated to the world uh, that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so as John was bringing about a message of repentance or a message of turning to God, turning away from the ways of the world, he baptized Jesus to demonstrate God's initiation into human history and the turning back to God in the most significant way. As Methodists, we believe in God's grace as the means through which we experience God's love and mercy, the means in which we are given new life and new birth, a new relationship with God. We are adopted into the family of God. And this is vital for us, not only as Methodists, but as Christians in terms of our understanding of who we are as we continue our faith journey with Jesus and or and, as disciples of Jesus and as we continue our faith journey to grow in our relationship with God. It is through the suffering, the, the death, the resurrection, 
as the the story uh, that we hold dear and we continue to replay uh, as the body of Christ in the life of the church as the means through which believers come into relationship. That being said, I, I want us to think about in a more spiritual way what our baptism means because even in our, our liturgy, we have ways of reenacting our baptism so that it continues to have meaning for us as individual Christians and as the church, the body of Christ. I want us to think about that uh, as we continue our conversation. And I will now turn it over to Reverend John Beer. Hi, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, but that that sweater is blinding my eyes. <laughs> Don't be a hater, Rev. Jeez. Okay. I want you guys to bear with me. Um, not 100% well yet, but feeling better. So just bear with me tonight. Um, thank you, Rev, for as always, um, giving us a great overview and um, theological overcasing of some of our themes that we're covering here. And so, like Rev said, we've been going through the Gospel of Mark and we're moving down or we're getting closer to the point where we're gonna talk about the baptism of Jesus and, and everything that, that that meant not only for Jesus in that moment, but for us. But before we get there, we want to, <clears throat> someone saying something? All right, before we get there, we want to um, finish covering quickly tonight the opening themes that we see in the opening of Mark's gospel. Now, let me tell you, why we're taking time to do this and assure you that we're not going to crawl through all of Mark's gospel, but we're taking some time at the beginning here to look at the themes, or we're going to take time here quickly tonight to look at the themes that Mark lays out in the opening of his gospel, because a technique that a lot of um, writers in Mark's day, in Jesus's day, uh, a, a technique that they would use is that in the opening of their text, what they're going to do is they're going to lay out the themes that they're going to want their audience to trace through, trace through their text. So Mark has certain themes laid out for us here at the beginning of the gospel that he is going to want us to see how they develop and see how they come to a climax in the story that he's telling. And if we're gonna understand what Mark is trying to say to us in his gospel, we want to pay some attention to these opening themes. So let us move on. All right, <clears throat> so as we get to the themes tonight, we're gonna start as always with the scripture and <clears throat> Can someone read this opening pericope of Mark chapter one? It's Mark chapter one, verses one to one to eleven. You can read it on the screen, or you can read it from your own translation. But anybody can read it, and we can get started for tonight. In the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, 
who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make, haste, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the tongue of his sandals. I have baptized you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heaven open, torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Here in the reading. Thank you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. So here, if you can see on the screen, I have three colors here um, over certain words. And what these colors represent are the opening themes that are important to Mark's gospel that he wants us to pay keen attention to. And we've already looked at um, one of them, which was, uh, we've already looked at one of them, which was a gospel. Mark and all of the gospel writers are starting off and letting you know that the type of literature that they're writing is a gospel. And we've been over, and we're not going to go over again tonight, that a gospel is <clears throat> a particular genre of story. It's a gospel in Mark's day was a declaration of the rise of uh, a new king who was coming into the world to take the throne. So that's the kind of narrative, that's the type of story that Mark is writing. That's the casing of the gospel. But last week, another thing that we began to look at that Mark is gonna want us to pay attention to is that he's writing about Jesus as the son of God. And what did we say last week that son of God means? What does son of God mean? Um, yeah, we'll start there. What did we say that son of God means? <clears throat> and anybody can answer. Um, even if you weren't here last week, when you hear the phrase son of God, what does this mean? The son of God is one that brings salvation and deliverance to his people. Ooh, salvation and deliverance to his people. Can you explain that a little more, Sister Eileen? What do you mean by that? Salvation and deliverance to his people. What is that? Uh, mean? That um, God has um, he gave up his one and only son so that we might have life. And that's how... Um, that's why he comes so that we might we might be delivered from our sins. Yeah. He is the uh, that um he is the proprietor for our sins. Yes indeed. Yes indeed. All right. All right. That's that's excellent. Somebody else, when we see this term, when we hear this term son of God, what did we say that this meant last week? Or what do you hear when you hear this phrase, son of God? Because Mark is writing about Jesus, the Christ, the son of God. So what does this mean? Um, could I say like redemption? Redemption. Okay. Okay. I like that. So important word in scripture what do you mean by that Matthew um I mean like I think when I think of well literally the words Christ son of God in my mind first thing just thinks of like redemption for us 
in terms of like redemption for our sin, like and giving us like a second chance in a way. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I think about. Excellent, excellent. He's given us a second chance. He came <clears throat> to give us redemption. Let me get one more person. One more person before we move on. Son of God, son of God, what does this phrase mean? Here, someone wanted to say something. What does it mean, son of God? All right, going once, going twice. All right, so we got some really great answers from Sister Eileen, Brother Matthew. <clears throat> One of the things that we began to do last week when we were looking at this theme is we took a look at what this phrase, son of God, or what it meant to be a son of God um, in terms of how the Old Testament describes it. And it's important that we go back and we try to hear what the Old Testament story is telling us. It's important because we want to hear the story that the Old Testament is telling us too. Because when we hear a phrase like the Son of God, there are already a lot of preconceived notions that we have that come with it, as a lot of us have grown up in church. But let's press a little bit and see what or revisit what this term meant in the Old Testament, because it's very connected to and important to Mark's meaning and why he is going to build out this theme of Jesus being the Christ, the Son of God. All right. I so, saw a king. Oh, go ahead. The king? The king? Yes, that is also very, very, very important. Yes. Okay. So we remember from last week, excuse me, if we remember from last week, when we looked at the old, all right, if we look at the Old Testament, one of the things that we saw is that the Old Testament uses son of God in um, two ways a number of ways, but two important ways to the New Testament. Number one is we can find it in Exodus 4, 22. And you'll find it in other places, but let's look here. It says, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn. So it's my firstborn son. So when in one way that the Old Testament is speaking about son of God, it speaks about Israel as being God's firstborn son. So one meaning that son of God has in the Old Testament is a way to speak about the people of Israel collectively. Um, as we see them in a special relationship with God as God's firstborn son. But let's look at another way that the Old Testament uses um, son of God. And this is in Psalm 2, and Sister Eileen just brought it up to the surface for us. Psalm 2, as we said when we were going through the Psalms, is a coronation psalm. It was a psalm that was read when, whenever um, there was a new king coming to the throne. So David would have heard this psalm read on the day of his coronation as he was being crowned king. Solomon would have heard this psalm read as he was being crowned, Rehoboam, all of the other ones. So it says, Psalm 2, I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I, I have begotten you. All right. So when we look at son of God and how Mark is going to draw attention to what this means is one of the ways that Mark is going to draw together the Old Testament meanings of son of God and trace this out as we go through the gospels is that son of God was a phrase that was used or to be a son of God meant 
uh, it was used as a reference to the whole people of Israel. And son of God or being God's son in the Old Testament also was a way of referring to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel was the person who represented all of the people of Israel. So the king represented the people, just like today, if the president were to go to a foreign country, he's not just representing himself, but he's representing all of the United States. So someone want to say something? Okay. So I want us to keep these two meanings in mind because Mark is going to build his gospel um, with this theme of Jesus being the son of God as, a, as the one who represents Israel as a whole and as the one who is the king of Israel. So keep those two things in mind. They're very, very important. All right, so why is this important? Why is this important? Because <clears throat> one of the things that we see in the prophets is that God promised to God promised to bless Israel. God made so many promises to Israel, so many grand promises to Israel that were going to affect the world. But in order for them to receive those promises, in order for the people of Israel to receive those promises, God said that they had to be faithful. And when we look throughout the, the prophetic literature or the prophetic books, um, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Obadiah, all of the major prophets and minor prophets, one of the major problems that the prophets are wrestling with is that on the one hand, God really wants to bless his people. But on the other hand, God was saying in order for me to bless you, you have to be faithful. So in order for Israel to not just receive, but to maintain the promises, they had to be faithful. And that was something that over and over and over again that we saw in the Old Testament that Israel could not do. They kept being unfaithful to God. And as the prophets are addressing this issue, they are going to say how God is going to fix this problem. Because if the problem is God needs a faith, God wants to bless, but he needs his people to be faithful so that he can bless them and entrust them with the blessings that he wanted to give them. In order for the people to receive the promises, they have to be faithful, but Israel is unfaithful. If that's the problem, the prophets are going to say the way that God is going to solve the problem is that God is going to take one, one person from the people of Israel who will be, who will be faithful. And through that one person, that person will represent all of Israel. And that person will receive the blessings and mediate those blessings to the world. One of the things that we see in Genesis, which is very important, is that God blessed Abraham so that he could be a blessing to all of the nations. And Israel was supposed to continue in that legacy. God wanted to bless them, not just for blessing's sake, but God wanted to bless Israel so that they could be a blessing to the world. He called them, set them up on a hill so that they could be a light on a shining hill to draw the rest of the world to him. But they were unfaithful. <clears throat> God begins to say through the prophets and through the prophetic books, we see this, that he will take one from Israel and that one will represent the whole of Israel. That one representative will be the king who represents his people and this one person will be the person that God will see 
and acknowledged as the faithful, true Israel who can inherit his promises. All right. And one of the places that we see that um, is in the book of Isaiah, beginning in about the chapter 48. So we're not going to go deep into Isaiah tonight. I mean, you have to kind of stick and move because we got to get through Mark. But before we move on, I want us to ask the question and think about this, not just for Israel's predicament in the Old Testament and how God solves it, but for our lives. <clears throat> if God wanted to bless his people, he was desiring to bless his people, but God was unwilling to bless them without faithfulness. What does that suggest about the relationship or what does that suggest rather about the role of faithfulness in our relationship with God? What role does faithfulness play in our relationship with God? I want to hear from you. Well, you see, um, well, first of all, good evening, and I'm glad you're feeling better, number one. Thank you, and thank you for calling me. I appreciate you, Brother Billy. Number two, in order for God to be blessed and for him to continue blessing us, we must bless him. Mm. In order to bless him, we must follow somewhat of what he's asking us to do. Nobody can be perfect mm -hmm. in what they do, but he wants you to come close enough that you can bless him and he can bless you. Amen. Amen. Now, that's important. But I want you to also hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that any of us have to work for God to love us. None of us, <clears throat> as Brother Billy said, um, are expected to be perfect. But there is a reality that those of us who are in a relationship with God, that God desires for us to be faithful so that he can entrust us with blessing. Let me hear from one or two more people. What is the what role does faithfulness play in our relationship with God? So it's saying um, faithfulness, faithful. You got to be faithful um, to, so God can bless can can bless us. He's not going to bless us if we are not faithful. Is that what it says? And um, as it says, God bless Abraham so he could be a blessing. So we have to be faithful so God can bless us so we can be a blessing to someone else. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> I'm bringing that up. And, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I would also say that when the Lord blesses us, it's not for us. Mm -hmm. It is we are the conduit of God's blessing to bless others. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. And again, God knows our limitations and he's not looking for perfection. That's not in our capabilities at this moment. One day it will be in the resurrection. But God knows our hearts. He knows when we're trying to be faithful. I see, Kyla, you have your hand. You want to say something? I was going to say like trusting him like through all like the different circumstances and like I don't know like trying to like keep the faith in him which also relates back to faithfulness but like yeah believing in God through all the things that go go on through your life. Amen yes believing in God through all the things that goes back that goes on through your life trusting in God. God just wants to see us at least um, attempting at faithfulness. So I say that because some Christians may have this idea that <clears throat> as long as I come to church, as long as I give my tithes and offering, as <clears throat> long as I keep the formalities, then me and God are, are cool. But when we look throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, one of the things that God asks of his people is for them to be faithful. Okay. So 
let's continue on in the, the gospel of Mark. And this desire for God to bless Israel, but needing a faithful Israel in order for him to be able to bless and in order for him to be, in order for Israel to be able to bless the world, God needed a faithful Israel. And so, as I said, one of the themes that we see in the prophets and especially in the book of Isaiah is that because Israel is unfaithful in much of its history, God is, begins to say in the prophets, well, I'll take one person from Israel. And through this one person who is faithful, to that one person I will look on as the faithful and true Israel. So one of the themes that we're going before, to see- Before we continue, um, Reverend John Deere, I think we need to explore or define this term faithful because for many <clears throat> faithfulness has a variety of meanings but in the context of uh, especially old testament writings uh, faithfulness uh, can be narrowed down when, when i think of of faithful as opposed to unfaithful. Uh, let's look at the Exodus story just for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, the people were relieved of the burden of slavery. Uh, Moses was their leader. The plagues were placed on the Egyptians. Uh, the Israelite people were freed and were to go to Mount Sinai to worship him. So, and to be obedient to his commandments and to love the scriptures, Deuteronomy speaks about loving the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, and thy mind. Mm -hmm. and to refrain from idolatry. In other words, to put God first in all aspects of their lives. So I just want us to pin, put a pin on this issue of faithfulness so that we have a clear uh, parameters of how we describe and define what we mean by that. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we need a clear definition. We need a clear definition. Thank you, Rev. That's clear. That's succinct. Love the Lord with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. That's the first commandment. That's the type of faithfulness that God desires from us. All right. So, this theme of Jesus as the son of God, Mark is gonna show us that Jesus is the true and the faithful Israel through which he is gonna bless the world. <clears throat> Jesus is the true and faithful Israel, the king who represents all of his people through which God can bless the world. All right, so one of the ways that all of the gospel writers are going to if I can move this out the way so you can see this better. All right. So one of the ways that the New Testament writers are going to depict Jesus as the true and the faithful Israel is by having Jesus relive, relive some of the very um, paradigmatic moments in Israel's history. All of the gospel writers do this. They portray Jesus as reliving the history of Israel, but with an important difference. In the places where Israel failed, Jesus is going to succeed. For instance, all of the gospel writers will portray Jesus right after his baptism 
um, as Jesus going into the wilderness to be tested. And just as Rev mentioned in the book of Exodus, what the Lord does to the people of Israel once they are freed from Egypt is that he allows Israel to go into the wilderness so that they can be tested. And like Kyla pointed out, they're going to have to show whether they are going to trust God or if they are going to not trust God. And as we see in the wilderness generation, that first generation that comes out of Egypt, they failed. They did not trust God. And that first generation did not enter the promised land. But when the gospel writers retell the story through the life of Jesus, they show Jesus going out into the wilderness and being tempted, being tested by the devil, but Jesus maintains his trust in God. And so he remains faithful. And this is going to be recurring throughout the gospel writers. They're showing you that Jesus is the true faithful Israel. And I wanna point this out because when you hear me say this, or when you go and you read uh, other commentators or other teachers, this is nothing new. This is basic New Testament theology. And I'm gonna tell you why it's important that we know this. Jesus reliving the history of Israel or representing Israel as a whole and succeeding where they failed, this is what the church fathers called recapitulation. One of our early church fathers writing in the early hundreds. So in the early years of the church was St. Irenaeus. And he said, it was fitting that he should be sent by the father, the creator of all things to assume human nature and should be tempted by Satan. He's talking about here in the wilderness and carry off a glorious and perfect victory. So take this in your mind. Jesus is the faithful Israel. He succeeds in the places that they failed. And again, a patristic scholar that I like, she says, Jesus's temptation in the wilderness shows how he recapitulated Old Testament experiences. Irenaeus concluded that Christ's faithfulness and temptation canceled humanity's disobedience and neutered Satan's power over us. All right, so why is that important? Because the New Testament depicts Jesus as the true and the faithful Israel and the one who because of his faithfulness to God, because of his unblemished faithfulness, receives all of God's promises. Second Corinthians 1.20 says, all God's promises, you see, find their yes in him. And that's why we say the yes, the amen through him when we pray. All of us who are in Christ, all of us who are in Christ are able to receive all of the promises and the favor of God. Now, why is that important? Because the scriptures teach us, especially when we get to the New Testament, that God's promises are not inherited, are not inherited by our ethnicity. They're not inherited by our culture. They're not inherited by our race. And this is important for our geopolitical moment because there are Christians who are in many ways justifying the slaughter that's going on in Gaza by saying, well, God promised that land to Israel. And if they are, if these Palestinians are getting killed, that's just what they get. Nikki Haley, South Carolina politician this week, just wrote on a bomb that's headed to Gaza. She wrote on it, finished it. And when we encounter this type of theology as Christians, where some Christians want to say that God's promises come through ethnic Israel or come through um, uh, ethnicity or race, we need to invite them to read 
the whole of the scriptures and not just Genesis 12, but the whole of the scriptures to see how the story plays out because it's only through Jesus. It's only through Jesus that we can inherit God's promises. Jesus is the faithful Israel and in him, all are able or have the opportunity to receive God's promises. So what does that mean for our geopolitical moment? There's not a person in the land of Israel today who has to get out of that land. There's not a person who is in the land of Gaza or the West Bank who has to get out of that land because of their ethnicity. According to the scriptures, the promises belong to he who is the faithful Israel, which is Jesus. And Jesus makes all of God's promises available to all of us. All right, so Jesus as the faithful, true Israel is one of the themes that Mark is going to um, build out as we go throughout the gospel, as we go throughout his gospel. All right, so these last themes, we're gonna have to blow through really quickly, okay? All right, so we've seen the theme of Mark is writing a gospel. We know what that is. We've seen the theme of Jesus is the promised king, the promised Messiah, check. We've seen the theme that Jesus is the son of God. And the son of God, one of the things that Mark is going to build out for us, one of the things that son of God means is that Jesus is the true faithful Israel through whom all of God's promises are brought, who, through whom God's promises are mediated through. And the last thing that we want to look at is the arrival of Jesus, the one through whom God's promises are mediated through, the arrival of Jesus beckons a new era. And in our opening chapter of Mark here, there are some strange things that are happening which signal for us that it is a new era. And just quickly, I'll mention these um, and then we'll <coughs> stop for the night. One of the things that's going to signal the theme that Mark is gonna build for us that it is a new era with the arrival of Jesus is these strange things. Strange thing number one, John is offering or proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now in the Old Testament, where did you get sins forgiven? All right, somebody answer quickly. How were sins in the Old Testament? Where did you go to when you needed to get sins atoned for? How does that happen? Anybody can say it. Where do the you priest. go? The priest. And the priest is where? In the oh, holiest of holiness. Yes, which is the temple. Which temple. Is the temple. <laughs> if you want to <clears throat> sins for yeah. in the old covenant, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, you have to offer up a, 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 a um, animal, a bird or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. An animal offering, uh, a grain offering, there are all these offerings and the place that you have to go to is the temple. But John is offering forgiveness of sins. He's proclaiming rather forgiveness of sins through repentance. He's no longer directing people to the temple. John is going to begin to direct people to Jesus. So that's a telltale sign that it's a new era something new is happening with the arrival of Jesus. All right, another telltale sign of the theme that- May I ask is... a question? Yes, May I ask a question? For John to do that, is it because he was known as the forerunner for Jesus Christ? Yes, he's known as the forerunner of Jesus. Um, he's known as the forerunner of Jesus. And he's also pointing to, as a forerunner, uh, what the book of Isaiah has 
prophesied, uh, especially in 53, but that whole larger section of the 50s on down into the end of the book, which is there will be a suffering servant who represents all of Israel, who is himself divine, who will take on the sins of all the people. So what John is doing as a forerunner is he's pointing backwards and he's pointing forward. He's pointing back to what the prophets have said about someone coming to take on our sins. And he's also alerting the people to the, to the point that it's that time now. Stop looking towards the temple and start looking towards the one who has come. All right, so another telltale sign that this is a new era is that John just isn't baptizing in any old water. He is baptizing in the Jordan. It's in the Jordan River that the people of Israel, as we see in the book of Joshua, it's God brings them through the Jordan River into the promised land. By John choosing the Jordan, he is signaling that something like or someone like Joshua, who is going to lead the people into a new era, is, is coming. Now, when you look at the, the, the names Jesus and Joshua, in English, we don't really hear an association. But in Hebrew, the book of Joshua is called the book of Yeshua. And in, and in Hebrew, Jesus' name is Yeshua. And when you translate Yeshua into Greek, you get Inesu. And Jesus' name, translated from Hebrew to Greek, is Inesu. So what John is doing is signaling that someone a new type of Joshua is coming to lead the people into a new era, just like the former Yeshua led his people of the old covenant to the new era. Someone want to say something? All right. And lastly, because I'm looking at the time, in the book of Jeremiah, and we'll see it in other places in the Old Testament, Another sign that it is a new era is, will be the arrival of the new covenant. And the new covenant, unlike the old covenant, is going to transform a person from the inside out. And a part of the new covenant will be the Holy Spirit living inside of all of God's people. Formerly, the presence of God, the Spirit of God, was dwelling in the temple or the presence of God, the spirit of God. People who were empowered by God were usually the kings or someone who was a deliverer. But a promise that God gave all of his people for the new covenant is that all of his people were going to be, are going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so this is why John is saying that this person who is coming is not just gonna baptize you in water, but he's gonna baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And the coming of the Holy Spirit to dwell inside of believers is a sign that the new covenant, that the new era has arrived. All right. And so this leaves us here for where we'll pick off, that where we're gonna pick up with next week, which is the baptism Go ahead. Can I um, yeah. back back to the um, the Greek meaning of Yeshua? Mm -hmm. um, if I can remember, I was told that it means deliverance. Yes. Yes, you own it. Yes, own yes. It. Jesus is going to deliver his people from their sins, like Matthew pointed out at the beginning that he is going to redeem his people from their sin. 
God has been wrestling with unfaithful Israel for a <clears throat> long time. And Jesus is coming because he wants to redeem them from their sins. He wants to help break their slavery to sin. And so that invitation is going to go out to all of Israel. And that invitation, that blessing is going to be mediated from Israel to the whole of the world by Jesus, that he is going to offer all of us the deliverance from our slavery to sin and more. And we'll see um, how this is going to play out in the life of Jesus um, as we begin next week with the place where Jesus' ministry really kicks off, which is his baptism. And I'll say this, and I'll turn it over to Rev. Please come back next week for really getting down into some details about the baptism of Jesus. Because one of the signs or one of the privileges of the new era that we're in, one of the privileges that we have is that we're going to be able to see God a bit clearer with more detail. We're going to be able to see God as he is in his triune nature, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And one of the clearest places that we begin to see this is at the baptism of Jesus. So when we talk about the baptism of Jesus, we're also going to get into a discussion about the Trinity and what that means concerning who God is, his being, and what it means for our lives. But all right, those are, we've completed the opening themes of the gospel of math, the gospel of Mark here, that Mark is going to draw out for us as we read through his gospel and going to bring them through to a, a climax. Um, and it's going to be a fun journey. It'll speed up from here now that we've got these basic themes um, pinned away in our hearts and minds. Uh, yeah, we'll continue on next. All right, so I'm going to stop here because we're... So leave those themes up, Reverend uh, John Via, because now we've gone complete circle from the introduction that I gave as it relates to uh, uh, an understanding of and of the meaning, the significance of baptism for us individually as Christians and for us <coughs> as the church in the context of God providing us with a Messiah, a promised king, uh, <clears throat> when Israel, who was designated such, was unable to fulfill its responsibility, its duty to be faithful, and that God continues despite the unfaithfulness of Israel to do a new thing, to restore, to redeem, to reconcile, to bring us together so that we are, have, we are and have through grace, the opportunity and the privilege for relationship with God in the most authentic way possible. I want us to remember that because too often we get caught up in our own understandings and our own interpretations of, of scripture based on what we may have experienced from childhood. And, and sometimes that clouds 
and distorts our ability to fully embrace the gift of God, uh, the grace of God, the love of God that has been provided through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is my hope that as Reverend John Vier has indicated, we continue to move forward. We will move forward with that in mind, and that will open up a new sense of, of wonder and joy and understanding of how blessed we are and how responsible we must be to share the good news that began with these writers long ago. We can't just sit on it, can't just sit on it. We've got to be the bearers and proclaimers of it as we live it. I believe Reverend Jean Vier said in a sermon that the Holy Spirit, in order to operate, we must live. We must not only uh, discern, but we must, it must be seen in the way we live our lives. Uh, and, and so this is exciting. And I pray that you will continue to encourage others to experience the study and the journey that we are on together. God bless you. Reverend John Vier, feel better. Uh, and if there are any others who are experiencing illness, I'm going through my own a little bout a little bit here, but God is good. And All the time. time God, is, God good. is good. Have a blessed evening. Oh, let us shout out the college students. Thank you all so much for being here, contributing and it's always beautiful when you join. We're so thankful for y'all and we're going to continue to pray for y'all and lift you up as you go yes. through. And we we the want to encourage you, Bulldogs, South Carolina <laughs> State University, all the way. God bless you. Have a good evening. Good night, everyone. It's time to go. <laughs> good night. <laughs>